And really just the idea that's in verse 5, but I'd like to read a few more verses uh, just to get the context. Verses 1 through 9. Here's where we're going to see the account of Abraham and how Abraham believed God and it was reckoned him as righteousness. We're also going to consider Paul's commentary on what David wrote in the psalm that we use for our call to worship and how we are forgiven, not by working our way into forgiveness, but rather by looking to the Lord, confessing our sins and receiving his forgiveness, the forgiveness that Jesus brought about on the cross. So let's read verses 1 through 9 to begin with. This is what Paul writes. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, and again, remember, justification is his acceptance with God, okay? If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say Abraham, for faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. Actually, I think I read a little bit into um, the next section. So, the idea here that I want us to focus on is verse 5. Again, pay attention to what Paul says here. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. And just so there's no misunderstanding, and this, well, we're, I'm going to hit on this again. Faith is not a work that we do in order for God to accept us. If that were the case, we'd be turning faith into, again, um, our own righteousness, something we do to be accepted by God. But it's just the opposite. It's nothing that we do. It's everything that Jesus does. So faith isn't a work we do. Faith is really looking away from ourselves and our works to Jesus only. And that which is credited to us or to Abraham as righteousness is not that act of faith, but rather it is the righteousness of Jesus Christ that is given to us, takes away our sins, clothes us with a perfect righteousness. So again, this, as you can see, is essential to the gospel. We are saved by grace through faith alone. Now, we have been looking at what are uh, unquestionably the most important things the Bible teaches. Certainly everything is important, but these are the essentials. What we need to know in order to be saved, what we need to believe in order to be saved, what we need, the one we need to trust in in order to be saved. Now, we have been going a bit deeper into them than we perhaps need to in order to be saved, but it helps us to better understand and remember when we go into a greater depth. You know, things that might otherwise be difficult become easy when you go into a greater depth. It's kind of like basic math. It becomes easier when you study algebra. You, know, you think math is hard, wait do you get to algebra. And then algebra becomes easy when you study geometry. And then, of course, when you study calculus, all of that stuff becomes relatively easy because it's just so many stepping stones to the greater depth. Now, what are the essential teachings? Well, first of all, that the Bible is God's self-disclosure. The one who created us has also spoken to us. And he's spoken to us for a variety of reasons. He, he wanted to tell us who he is. That he isn't this creation. He isn't what he made. That he is separate from this. That he's not physical, but he is a spirit. That he isn't limited, but he's unlimited in every possible way. And that he isn't one person, but he is three. Father, Son, 
and Holy Spirit. And these three have always shared something that really everybody longs for, everybody desires, but they have had in its perfection from all eternity, and that is a perfect friendship and fellowship. And the thing about the gospel is, the great thing about it is that they want to share this fellowship also with us. That's what Jesus was praying for in his high priestly prayer. That that love which they, that they shared among themselves, that they might be able to share that also with those that Jesus came into the world to save. Now the Lord tells us in his word as well how we might live, that we can have this fellowship with him and with one another. But he's also warned us what it is that's in the way of that fellowship, what the problem is, why we don't have it now, why we don't come into the world with it. And that's because he made us good like himself so that we could have fellowship, but we turned away from him and have come under his judgment. But praise the Lord, he has also told us how this fellowship can be restored, how his son became one with us to do what we failed to do, to suffer and to die in our place, and to be raised again from the dead so that we might be saved. Now that's what we've seen so far. Today, let's consider that last essential truth, how we can receive what Jesus did. And the way we do it, of course, is by faith. Now this morning, we'll be reminded that we are justified by faith alone, by what Jesus has done alone. This evening, we're going to look at the fact that the faith that saves us, the work of the Holy Spirit within our lives, is not alone. It's not a bare faith. It's not just simply a trusting in Jesus, but it radically transforms our lives into the image of Jesus Christ. Both of these truths are important, that we are saved by grace through faith alone, that we are justified. I want to make sure I distinguish those two words. But we are not justified by a faith that is alone. So this morning, let's consider the first point. And let's begin by asking this question, who is it that would disagree with us on this particular point? And the answer is absolutely every cult that exists. As a matter of fact, this is the, the mark of a cult, not the only mark, but perhaps one of the most important ones. If you were to ask the Mormons, how are you saved? How are you justified? How are you accepted by your God and your religion? They would say this, you need to be baptized. You need to live a good life, outwardly moral. Then if you do this, you will live in paradise when you die. And of course, if you want to be a god, you have to make sure you're married in the temple and you do so much work as a missionary and so forth. So works, they would point you to your works. This is what you have to do, A, B, and C, and then you get D. If you were to ask the Jehovah's Witnesses, they would say something like this. You need to join their organization, the Watchtower Society. You need to study the Bible with them. You need to go door to door with them. And if you are faithful all the way to the end, then you will live in paradise on earth. If you were to ask Islam, how do you achieve paradise in their view? Well, they would say you have to observe the five pillars of Islam. You need to make the good confession, which is there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. You need to pray twice a day in the morning and in the evening. You need to give alms to the poor. You need to fast, particularly during the month of Ramadan, and you need to make a pilgrimage at least once in your life to Mecca. So again, do these five things, you'll end up in paradise, and of course, if you want to go directly to paradise, then die in a holy war, and then you will. Roman Catholicism, this is where we part company with Rome, and the reason why they are considered to be a cult because they believe salvation comes by works. We're going to look a little bit more at that this evening when we consider how works actually fit into this. But they believe that you need Jesus, but you need the mediation of the Roman Catholic Church. You need their interaction. You need their involvement in your life by the ministry of the sacraments. They believe you need these sacraments. And these are works the priests do to give you grace, and you do work to get this grace. Now, some of, this, some of these things you don't, really, you're not really involved in, but you have to be baptized to get that initial amount of grace that makes you alive. 
You need to be confirmed at a certain age when you get grace when you're confirmed and that allows you to go to mass and you need to eat and drink the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you cannot maintain that grace you need when you commit sins to plug up those holes and uh, through penance. So there's more works that you do, penance and, well, you need confession, absolution and penance. And then when you're about to die, you need a last dose of grace through extreme unction. So again, they have grace for you from the beginning of your life to the very end, but these, this is just a whole series of works that one does, looking to the priest to give you this grace rather than looking to the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Now sadly, there's even some within the Protestant church who may say that they believe that they are accepted and justified by God by faith alone, but they don't live as though they actually believe this, and we're going to see that in our application. Now, when we say that Jesus did the work, which is what we looked at last week, we, we mean by this not only that he is the only one who could do this work, because remember, we couldn't. We failed in Adam. We already came into this world guilty, hating God, under God's judgment. But we also mean that he did it so that we wouldn't have to do it. We couldn't do it, so he had to do it. And we don't have to do it now because he has. Grace is receiving something that you and I do not have to work for, something that is absolutely free. For God to accept us as righteous in his sight, to, to be acceptable to God, to declare us to be just by his free grace alone, which is what Paul is telling us, is by grace, a gift of his mercy, we have to receive what Jesus did without any work on our part. And again, the only way we can do this is by faith alone. So what does that mean? Well, it means, first of all, that we need to know about the gift that he is offering to us, which we learn about when we hear the gospel preached. That's why it's important. If there's somebody you know that doesn't know Christ... They need to hear the gospel preached. What if they already know what the gospel is? Well, they need to hear it again because it's under the communication of the gospel, whether preaching or sharing it by witnessing other people, that the Spirit of God works. And yes, it's true that he can work in, you know, by memory. He can bring to mind what people have heard, and sometimes people who have heard the gospel are walking down the street. Suddenly, the Spirit of God brings it to their minds again, and he raises them to life. They're saved right there. But he most often does it under the preaching and communication of the gospel. So we need to hear the gospel preached. We need to hear somebody tell us about it. But secondly, we need to believe that this is a real offer, that, that, that we really are in danger. There really is a Savior, and he really offers to forgive our sins, that Jesus has done everything that, that needs to be done, and that he really will give salvation to all who call upon him. And third, we need to trust him actually to do that. To look away from what we've done, our own righteousness, our own good works, to what he has done alone to save us. Now again, I want to emphasize those three different parts of faith because we need all three. It isn't enough to hear the gospel. Many people have heard and they haven't believed and they're not saved. It's not enough to believe that what we've heard is true. James writes, and we'll see a little bit more about this this evening, in James 2, verse 19, you believe that God is one, one being. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. Now, what James is saying here is that the demons believe the essentials, not just that there is one God, but they believe the whole package. They know who Jesus is. They know what Jesus has done. They also know that that Jesus, who is God in human flesh, is one day going to judge them, and they are terrified by it. They do more than most people who believe these things to be true and haven't trusted Jesus. But these demons are no better for their belief because believing the facts does not change them and it does not save them. It only terrifies them because they can't trust in Jesus, and they never will because a Savior has not been provided for the demons. Believing these things 
to be true, we need to trust Him to save us. You know, the confusion comes when we read the Bible and it says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And we think, well, all that means is just believe it's true. Believe Jesus has done all these things. But that's not actually what the word means in the Greek. It means more than just being convinced that something is true, though it does mean that. It means to put your confidence in something or someone, to entrust yourself to that person, in this case, the Savior. If we would be saved, we must place our whole hope of entering into heaven, our acceptance before God on Jesus and on Jesus alone. Okay, that's what we are saying here. So it's more than knowing the facts. It's more than believing it's true. You must actually trust him and trust him only to get you into heaven. And that really brings us to the second point, which is this. If Jesus did it all, and we receive what he did by faith, by putting our trust in him, then listen carefully, our works really have nothing to do with our justification. They have nothing to do with our justification. Whenever we think they, they have something to do with our justification, we are in dangerous ground. Now to understand this, I told you we were gonna look at this, we do need to understand the difference between these words, justification, and salvation. Now again, what is justification? Justification is God's declaration that we are righteous. He says to you, you are not guilty. And he says to you, you are righteous. You've done everything right. Well, you see, that is only because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's not because of what we've done. That is what we receive by faith alone. That is what saves us from hell. That is what allows us to enter into heaven. That is what justification is, and we often confuse it with the word salvation because when we are justified, we're saved. So we think the two words are actually the same thing, but they're not. Justification is, though, that act that it causes us to enter into salvation. Now, salvation is actually a broader word, and it refers to everything that God has done for us and everything God will do for us, and it goes beyond justification. That's part of it, but it's not all of it. So it includes it, but it also includes something called sanctification, among other things. There's also the inheritance, the adoption, all of these things that, that are a part of the package of salvation and final glorification and entering into the new heavens and the new earth. But sanctification is included in salvation, and sanctification is what the Spirit of God does in us to make us more like Jesus. That's the reason why Jesus came into the world, was to make us like him. His work in us is what moves us to do the work that we do. But these works, remember, are not meritorious works. Now, we're going to look at this this evening. We're justified by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. Saving faith is a gift of the Spirit of God, and it is a working faith. So when we say that we are saved by grace through faith alone, we are not saying that works are not involved in, in salvation at any level. They're involved in our sanctification. They are the evidence of our justification. But they do not earn anything. We need to keep them out of justification. That is the work of Jesus Christ alone, His grace alone, received by faith alone. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 11:6, where again he points out how grace and works are mutually exclusive, that it has to be one or the other. It cannot be both. He writes this, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. That's why we have to keep works out of the picture. And what happens when we try to add our works to our justification? If we try to work for God to accept us? Well, we read earlier, Paul tells us that we destroy the gospel. We destroy the good news. We destroy the offer of free grace saying that you have to work for it now. And it's not simply a gift. Let me read again what Paul writes to the Galatians because this applies to anything 
that we add to salvation, anything, or I should say justification, anything we add to our justification as the grounds of our acceptance with God falls under this condemnation. He writes in Galatians 5, verses 1 through 5, it was for freedom that Christ set us free, free from the ceremonial law, free from any law that, by which we justify ourselves. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Remember at the Acts 15 council, why would you lay upon the necks of these disciples a yoke which neither we nor our, fore, our forefathers could bear? It's not by keeping the, the ceremonial law, okay? Do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And again, put in the place of circumcision anything that you might want to add to Jesus. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. For through the Spirit, we through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. And again, as I said before, if you try to do some of it yourself, Jesus, you know, you, you part of it, I'll do part of it, you're actually taking on the whole of it. It's got to be Jesus or you. And if you try to take any of it from Jesus, it becomes all you. Okay? So you try to do part of it, then you're under obligation to do the whole thing. But the point is you can't do that. It has to be Jesus. You have to let him do it. We cannot do it. Now, what Paul is warning us against here is legalism. Okay? That's what we were looking at in the Ferguson study, legalism. Now, legalism is not what many people think. A legalist is not somebody who believes, I need to keep the law of God in any sense. I mean, that I need to obey. That's not a legalist. So I've been called a legalist because I believe you need to obey what the, what the Bible says. When Jesus says, this is how I want you to live, that, that that's the way you need to live. That's not what legalism is. That's what we call evangelical obedience. Jesus tells us that we need to keep the commandments. It's a part of our sanctification. It's a matter of fact, the way that we show Jesus that we actually love him. Listen to what he says in John 14, verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. How do you show Jesus that you love him? According to this verse. If you love me, you'll go to church. If you love me, you'll sing praise songs. If you love me, you'll spend time in prayer. Well, all those things are true. But it'll include everything that the Lord calls us to do. That's how we show him that we love him. Not by grudgingly obeying, I really don't want to do this, but I'll do it anyway but because we want to do it. That's exactly what the Spirit of God does in our hearts. That's not what legalism is, though. That's evangelical obedience. A legalist is somebody who tries to justify themselves through their own works. And I would again point you to the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. They went into the temple to pray, and the Pharisee is lifting his eyes up to heaven, and he says, I thank you, God, that I'm not like this man here. I thank you that I fast twice a week and I give of everything that I have and I do all these good works. And he was justifying himself, okay? That's a legalist. The tax gatherer or the tax collector, he didn't even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he was pounding on his chest and saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. He humbled himself before the Lord, confessed his sins, and he found the blessing that David found through the confession of his sins. He found forgiveness. He, Jesus said, that one went to his house justified. Not the Pharisee. See, the Pharisee is the legalist, the one who humbles himself and trusts in Jesus and God's mercy alone. He is the one who is justified. Now, what are some of the ways, though, that we might actually be guilty of doing the same thing the Pharisee was doing, even though we think that we're actually trusting Jesus alone? Well, I've already given you one of them at the beginning, and that is when we look at our faith as the reason why God justifies us. If we read that passage in Romans chapter 4, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, it was credited to him as righteousness. If we think that God looks at Abraham and we say, good Abraham, it was good that you had faith, it was good that you believed in me and I'm going to now take that belief, that act of obedience and that is your righteousness, that's the righteousness by which you are justified. That's how some people read this. But if you read it that way, you have justified yourself. You are a legalist, okay? That's not what faith is. 
Faith isn't a work we do to make ourselves just. Faith is a looking away from what we do, everything that we've done to Jesus and what he has done only. That's what Abraham actually did. He trusted God. He trusted him to send the seed. Abraham saw my, my day, Jesus said, and he rejoiced. But he saw it through faith, okay, which is the same way actually we have to see it. We can also be legalists when we believe that Jesus justified us, but now we have to maintain that justification. We have to keep ourselves justified by keeping up a certain level of good works. Otherwise, I'm going to fall out of the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to be cast out of the, the family of God. If we believe that, then we are legalists. Remember, we are declared just by Jesus' work, and we are kept in His grace by the continuing work of His Holy Spirit who keeps us going the right direction, but we don't maintain our justification once Jesus has saved us. He has justified us once and for all. When we think that we become better than our brothers and sisters because we do more of the right things and they do, you know, more of the wrong things, we become legalists if we think somehow we're shining in God's eyes because in Jesus, we are equally righteous. Now, I'm not saying that God doesn't choose some to do particular things and doesn't show favor on some and it doesn't please, I'm not saying it doesn't please God when we do the things that he calls us to do and he doesn't bestow favor on them, but we are no better than our brother or our sister because we are all clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, his perfect righteousness. When we think that God is standing over us as a judge, ready to pounce on us, ready to destroy us if we step out of line, and you know sometimes we end up thinking that way, don't we, especially when we read the Puritans, we can somehow get the impression that that's the way it is with the Christian life. God loves me, but as soon as I step out of line, then his hatred and his judgment is just waiting there to destroy me. Well, no, if we think that, again, we become legalists because remember, when we trust in Jesus, he adopts us into his family. And he loves us now as his children. And everything that he does for us now is out of love, even when he corrects us for our sins. He's not waiting to pounce on us as a judge, but he is waiting to discipline us when necessary to get us to go the right way because he loves us. So that's the idea. You know, when we trust in Jesus, we move out of the courtroom into the family of God. That is true. If we are outside of Jesus, we're still in the courtroom and we still are under that threat. But when we trust in Jesus, we move into his family and now we experience the love of God. When we believe that we need to clean up our act before Jesus will accept us to begin with, then we become legalists. The Bible says if we are burdened by our sins and we want to be free from our sins, Jesus calls us to come to him and he will free us. And we don't have to qualify to come. All we have to do is want to come. Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know, this is the idea that was in the marrow controversy. Is it right to say that I have to repent before I can come to Jesus? No, actually that was wrong. You don't have to repent before you come to Jesus. Jesus tells you to come now, but when you come to Jesus, you will repent. That's the work of the Spirit of God in your life. You will repent. You'll turn from your sins because you'll hate those sins and you'll love Jesus. But you don't have to clean up your act before you come to Jesus. If you do that, you're a legalist, thinking that you have to kind of shine yourself up, clean yourself up. Before you can come, Jesus says, come now. He justifies the ungodly. He doesn't justify the godly. And then think about this. What could we possibly add to what Jesus has done anyway? Remember, his works are perfect, but ours are not. Ours are flawed. Ours are worthless. Think about it in these terms. Jesus offers to give us something that is that is, you know, of inestimable value, the pearl of great price, something beyond worth, something that is, has greater value than all the wealth of this world and all the wealth of this universe. And he offers to give it to us freely as a free gift. Now, what do you think he thinks when we come up to him and we offer to buy it from him instead? 
especially with what it is we have to barter with. I mean, what do we have to barter with? Uh, a mountain of manure, essentially. That's what Paul says all of his works were. When he was a Pharisee and unconverted, that's what we're talking about. He couldn't justify himself by this mountain of, of trash and garbage and filth that was repugnant to the Lord. Jesus is going to give us something precious and we're going to try to buy it from him with that kind of commodity. There, there's No, we cannot buy our justification. We cannot add to our justification. We cannot preserve our justification. All we can do is receive it as the Lord freely offers it to us through the gospel. It's a free gift of His grace. It has to be received as a free gift or it's not received at all. If you haven't already received this grace, received this offer of salvation, if you haven't come to Jesus, May the Lord give you his spirit that you might receive that free gift this morning freely. Now this evening we're going to consider how the faith that the Lord gives us by his Holy Spirit will transform our lives from the inside out so that we will do what he calls us to do. Works are a part of salvation. They are part of the package. They are necessary. They must be there, but they are not meritorious. They do not earn our justification. That is something that Jesus has purchased for us by himself alone. And we receive it by, again, by faith. That's really what the table reminds us again this morning. Jesus did this so that he might save us. He didn't do this to make it possible for us to save ourselves. He didn't do this so that we would be left on our own to save ourselves. He did this so that he might give us a complete salvation. All we need to do is trust in him. So as we bow in just a moment of prayer, let's, let's thank the Lord for his mercy to begin with and his grace. Let's also examine our hearts to make sure that we are trusting in Jesus. And let's also repent of, of our sins and ask the Lord to examine our hearts to show us what we need to do to be ready to come to the table. And then we will um, come to the table to remember Jesus and to have communion with him and to receive what it is he has for us today. Well, let's, let's bow in prayer, shall we?